Okay. Now live. All right. We're back. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Wine Wednesday. I'm Phil Wente. I'm sitting in for Nikki and Allie. Um, Allie is close by. She's going to be helping with questions. There she is. So I'm not completely by myself. I do have somebody that uh, is keeping track of whether or not I am doing the right thing and get prodded uh, in the right directions. Well, and also in honor of the fact that tomorrow is National Chardonnay Day, uh, we have four different Chardonnays we're tasting today. You can see them lined up here on the camera. We uh, have Eric Chardonnay, which is unoaked. We have the Morning Fog Chardonnay, and Eric's is from Livermore Valley. We have the Morning Fog Chardonnay, also Livermore Valley, which is roughly 50% barrel fermented and 50% stainless steel. We have our Riva Ranch Chardonnay from our vineyards in Arroyo Seco, and we have our Nth Degree Chardonnay uh, from the Livermore Valley as well. So that'll be fun. Uh, if I get through all four of those, I may not make the end of the show, but uh, that's part of the fun, right? We're here. It's five o'clock somewhere, five o'clock right here. And with that, I'm going to take a little sip of Eric Chardonnay. Mm. And I have to say, I'm really not a sipper. I'm a drinker. I like big <laughs> mouthfuls. I love to feel the texture. I love to get that, that full mouth feeling, cover my tongue, coat my mouth, enjoy all of the flavors, the crispness, the Mm, and the finish on that just keeps going and going and going like green apple. Uh, so very enjoyable. Chardonnay, uh, and we can have some fun here. Uh, we can do a little bit of history. We can talk Chardonnay. We can talk other things um, and uh, really make it a, a, a wonderful Wine Wednesday, just enjoying wine and friends and hanging out. Um, what we love about Chardonnay is that it's such a versatile grape. It's such... Uh, an open palette for the winemaker to be able to design different styles and that uh, there's so many people that enjoy it from A to Z. Uh, I being one of those, there's no particular style that I like more than the next and uh, these particular four wines, I love them all. We started growing Chardonnay way back in 1908 when my great-grandfather sent my grandfather over to the Theodore Gear Vineyard in Pleasanton to obtain some cuttings of Chardonnay and start a small four-acre plot. Uh, they supplemented that plot by importing some Chardonnay in conjunction with a professor from UC Davis where my grandfather was going to school, uh, Professor Leon Bonet, whose brother was running the F. Richter Nursery in Montpellier, which was the most renowned supplier of, of uh, wine or vines uh, of high quality in that era. Uh, so they imported some Chardonnay in 1912 and added to the small plot another two acres. So um, prior to Prohibition, six acres was what Wente Vineyards was growing. So it was not a lot. With the repeal, uh, when Wente Vineyards started varietal labeling, and we needed enough uh, of each variety to actually have meaningful amounts, we really started to expand the Chardonnay. And that's when my grandfathers started walking the vineyard at harvest and tasting grapes, uh, selecting the finest vines, trying to improve on the intensity of the flavors and began planting new vineyards. And with each one of those new additions, he was able to select the best physiological and most intense flavored vines and and really create uh, a renowned Chardonnay vineyard. Uh, so uh, it, it, it was a very slow process. Um, and I think, you know, I was on this wonderful program about six weeks ago, and we talked a lot of California wine history at the time, but um, prior to prohibition, uh, the wine industry really had a great rebirth from basically 1880 to uh, 1918, where they focused on the best, finest varietals from Europe and made wonderful table wines. Uh, and when Prohibition came around, 90% of those vineyards were lost. So when Repeal came, there were very, very few acres of Chardonnay, of Sauvignon Blanc, of Simeon, of Cabernet, of Merlot, Cabernet Franc, etc. Uh, Pinot Noir. And so it was really a long haul 
of hard work for my grandfather and great uncle at repeal to rebuild uh, the, to help rebuild, I should say, the California wine industry and to let the consumer know what we were making and how we were going to go about it, which is what brought about Verado labeling. Because my great uncle Herman said, the most important thing for a consumer to know is the producer, where it's from, what's in the bottle, and put your faith and family behind it. So that was how they started with Chardonnay. And um, uh, we've been at varietal labeling uh, ever since. And uh, in fact, our very first varietal label was in 1932 Sauvignon Blanc. So anyway, uh, the Eric Chardonnay is 100% stainless steel fermented, as I say. It's named after my brother, Eric, because he loves this style of Chardonnay and he, and his son Carl used to get into some fun discussions about how the best way to make Chardonnay was. And I think that at the end of the day, Carl finally said, I'm gonna make a Chardonnay exactly the way that you're talking about it. And this is the result. And it's a beautiful, crisp, intense fruit, wonderful wine. So dad, there was a question that came up um, that Eric's is all stainless steel and it's very crisp. But what makes a Chardonnay buttery? They're wondering why the you would describe the Riva as more of a buttery wine than the morning than Eric's. So um, the, there's what the again to repeat the question that Ali asked me is what makes a Chardonnay buttery? Um, so there's a, a number of factors that influence uh, the flavors of Chardonnay. First of all is is the vineyard and the intensity of the fruit. Second is the fermentation and the yeast and the way the fermentation is conducted and in what kind of container or vessel. Uh, and then those barrels or containers or stainless steel can control flavors in one way or another. So buttery generally comes from barrel fermenting Chardonnay and then allowing it to go through a malolactic fermentation, which is a secondary bacterial fermentation that uh, metabolizes the malic acid and turns it into lactic acid, which is basically the acid of milk. And that process has that sort of uh, butteriness to it. Uh, and then as the yeast and the bacteria finish their jobs, if you age the wine on the lees or on uh, in the barrel, uh, with the, the microbials, uh, they also absorb flavor from that. So a lot of people uh, stir the, the uh, barrels and try to absorb more, without getting too technical here, more of the uh, buttery flavors. Now, the barrel itself, uh, depending on how you toast the wood, if you think of raw wood uh, and uh, th that it can smell almost like a two by four resiny pitch sap, whatever, if you take a barrel and toast it, my, my cleanup lady is here from me spelling Chardonnay on the table. Um, if you take a barrel and toast it, you caramelize the sap, which gives those vanilla, uh, wonderful sort of caramel flavors. And depending on how far you go with the toast and the vanilla to caramel to very uh, uh, smoky, intense flavors, you will also add to that butteriness because vanilla is, is uh, a, a very uh, uh, positive addition to the sort of buttery nuances. And uh, as you go along, you can add additional flavors from the barrels and come up with a really well-balanced, wonderful wine, which uh, I would say, as you go through our lineup here today, you see uh, a little bit of those nuances in the morning fog, more and more in the Riva Ranch, and then powerful uh, uh, nuances of that influence in the nth degree Chardonnay, which has a lot of barrel influence, as well as the malolactic and butteriness of the Chardonnay. So that was a long answer to a short question. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, and without hopefully getting too technical so that I'm not uh, talking about acid pH and ridiculous stuff, but I'm going to have a little drink of the morning fog Chardonnay right now, just to look at how adding a little bit of barrel fermentation and malolactic into a wine can give you that vanilla butteriness in a nice subtle direction. 
Perfect. And you actually answered someone else's question. BWK68 had asked what mm -hmm. makes Ent different from the others. And I think you described that as you um, kind of went through the line up. So nice. Yeah. So um, we have people from Alberta sending you love and New Zealand. Hey, cheers to Alberta and New Zealand. Cheers to all of us here in the U.S. Um, I hope everybody's hanging in there. Uh, as we all are trying to do. And I know that my glass of wine every day definitely gets me through it. So uh, I'm moving on to the Riva Ranch and um, it really punches up the butteriness and the um, winemaking flavors that we just discussed that you can attain through um, a combination of barrels. Uh, and you, the, the winemakers have the ability to experiment with the amount of barrels. The newer, the when a barrel's brand new, you get the majority of flavor extraction in the first usage, probably 80%. Let's say 15 to 20% in the second usage, and then the barrel sort of goes neutral after that, other than allowing oxidative reactions to happen, which also give sort of a nuttiness and a richness to the wine. Uh, so depending on the level of barrel, new barrels that you use in winemaking, it will greatly influence the intensity of the addition of those barrel flavors. Uh, and that's always um, like cooking with spices. It's a delicate thing. You want to make sure you allow the fruit and the, the beautiful quality of the grapes to come through without uh, necessarily dominating it, um, like cooking with garlic. You can make anything taste like garlic and nothing else. And we can do the same with wine and barrels. You can put so much barrel influence into wine that it smothers all the fruit and becomes sort of one dimensional. So the idea is to uh, constantly be tasting through the barrels, making sure that you're uh, coming up with a, a style that you think your consumers like. And, uh, and I'm really focused on that because we're making wine for you, not for us. If you, I always say, if you make wine for yourself, you only sell a few bottles. <laughs> I don't think that's true. So tell right. us a little bit more history. We were left off in talking about. Well, I have to have a, I have to have another sip of Chardonnay to get um, to get ready back into mm. the history. So the, there was a rebirth um, in so Pocomore Valley. One of the things that um, uh, let's jump a little farther back in history. One of the really interesting things about how the world came to um, appreciate wine grape varieties is the way that they were marketed and shipped around the world. And if you think about uh, the early history, uh, well, the early history, but the 1700s, the 1800s of people distributing wine, uh, the British were the primary sort of international wine merchants. They picked up uh, wines that, that you put on sailing ships and took around the world and distributed them. The wines of Bordeaux were a little sturdier, um, Sauvignon Blanc, Cabernet Sauvignon, and its its compatriots were certainly uh, wines that shipped easier than Burgundian wines. The uh, Pinot Noir in the Burgundies was much more difficult to put on a sailing ship, take around the world, as was Chardonnay, much more delicate. So it, there was very, in, in the early years, people weren't as familiar with Chardonnay and Pinot Noir as they were with Cabernet and Sauvignon Blanc. Um, when the wine business in California first started, there was very, very little focus on either of Chardonnay or Pinot Noir. There, there, it was planted here in the 1880s and 1890s and grown by a few people that, that did specialize in it. Um, particularly like Paul Masson, who was uh, one of the early famous champagne makers before Prohibition, who had uh, substantial plantings of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, as well as uh, the small amount that Winty Vineyards had. Uh, but when uh, Prohibition, 15 years of Prohibition came along, almost all of those vineyards were lost. And it's kind of interesting. I, I, um, I came across some correspondence uh, between Martin Ray, who was who purchased the Palmasan winery, in, I think 1936, when Palmasan uh, was at the end of his life, and then ran it until uh, around 1943. But he was corresponding with Maynard Amarine, who was the uh, professor of the, or really got the Department of Enology started at UC Davis right after repeal in the in the mid 30s, 
about the sources of uh, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir that were available in the state. And uh, Maynard Amarine had said that he had gone in 1936, he had gone all around the state of California looking for remaining Chardonnay and Pinot Noir vineyards and then making small lots of wine off of each of the vineyards that he found. Um, and I, I can guess that it probably didn't even total 50 acres of either variety in the entire state. Uh, and he said that the Theodore Gear Vineyard in Pleasanton made the finest Chardonnay of all the samples uh, that he had produced that year and wrote this in this letter to Martin Ray uh, at Paul Masson. And, um, uh, or by then it was Martin Ray's own vineyard. He had sold Paul Masson to Seagram's in, in 43 or 44, something like that. Uh, and um, he had moved up the hill farther in the Santa Cruz Mountains up above Saratoga to start a new vineyard. And, and this is sort of what brought the conversation around was that he had planted a vineyard five years earlier and was asking Dr. Amarine where he had gotten the, the uh, budwood from the university and he wanted to know the source of the budwood for this vineyard that he had planted for the Smith family in, in uh, Los Gatos. And he had gone down and taken cuttings off of that vineyard and planted it in the Martin Ray vineyard. And Maynard Amarine said that uh, he believed that it came from Block D at the University of California Davis uh, Plant Foundation. And uh, that uh, the original source of that was from the Leon Bonet importation, uh, which would have been part of the original source of the Winty. Uh, as well. And so Martin Ray had uh, planted that vineyard, that wood up in his vineyard. Then uh, about six months later, uh, Dr. Amarine wrote Martin Ray another letter saying that um, he really thought he was mistaken that the, uh, the Chardonnay that was in Block D at the university had come from the Theodore Gear vineyard because it very much resembled the wine, uh, the, the vines and the grape clusters resembled the wine that he made in 1936. And I was just laughing reading this correspondence saying that it's amazing that Martin Ray's selection for his Saratoga vineyard was actually the same two sources as the Winty vineyards. But there's a Martin Ray, which a uh, clone, which is called the Mount Eden clone. Uh, so the Mount Eden clone, the Winty clone are virtual brothers. Uh, which is an incredible coincidence going back in history. So with that, let's take a little sip of the uh, Riva Ranch. Uh, and uh, here's to all my Riva divas. Hi, Julie, I know you're at home watching and drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Not all of the dogs there. I saw a lot of other comments of Riva divas mm. on here too. So the Riva Ranch's uh, Chardonnay is from our Rose Seco vineyards and we bought land in Arroyo Seco in 1962, right at the end of 1962, and planted the vineyards in 1963. And because we weren't sure that the Livermore Valley was going to become fully developed as a housing tract rather than allow agriculture to continue to exist, so we were looking uh, for a place where we could continue to produce wines. Fortunately, uh, cooler heads prevailed, and we were able to uh, continue producing wine here in the Livermore Valley, but we also found that we loved the Arroyo Seco area in Monterey County um, and the particular vineyard that we bought from the Riva family, which is why we call it the Riva Ranch. So, uh, what, what kind of difference in fruit do you get from the Riva versus the Livermore? Ah, the question was, what's the difference in fruit between the uh, Riva vineyard and the Livermore vineyards? And uh, it's, it's a little stereotypical, but we've always said that we thought the fruit from the Riva vineyard was a little more tropical, a little bit more like a banana aroma, maybe uh, some apricots and a little pineapple, uh, whereas the Livermore fruit, and I think it's, it's uh, you know, it's the regional difference, the, the little bit of weather and uh, uh, soil differences, but primarily weather that uh, make up the difference. So the Livermore fruit is a little bit more green apple, uh, a little bit more pear, and um, uh, they're essentially the same uh, heritage in the, the Chardonnay clones. And so uh, it, it really does just highlight the difference in areas and also the difference in winemaking style. I see so, a funny comment here that says, can a chap be a Riva geezer? <laughs> I think we came up mm -hmm. with a funny term, Riva Steva, last I'm, time. I'm a Riva geezer. <laughs> I, I, 
I don't know how old you have to be to be a geezer, but uh, I, some mornings I'm sure I'm a geezer. <laughs> no. <laughs> so the answer is no. yes. Men can be Reba Divas, Reba Steva, Reba De Geezers. Um, well, so the uh, uh, the you know back to a little bit of history oh. uh, of how we got. This is a fun comment. Oh, what is do we got? Wendy created a Phil's label. What would the style be? <laughs> I don't think Wendy will create a Phil's label, but um, uh, I, I'm, uh, as I said at the beginning of this, I, I truly love all the various styles of Chardonnay. And so- Don't skirt the question. I'm not skirting the question. Um, where, where do I drink uh, more often? I probably drink in a spectrum of Riva to nth degree more often than I drink in a spectrum of Eric's to uh, morning fog. So I do like uh, the richness and the intensity of flavors that additional winemaking, barrel fermentation and barrel aging can add to the wine. Uh, I find it very interesting. I, um, But that said, I don't eat spaghetti every night. I don't eat steak every night. I love variation I, and I would get very bored just having one wine to drink. So I... Uh, I love the idea of making as intense a style uh, as you can in some ways, sort of taking the winemaker's art to extreme. And I'm very proud of my nephew, Carl. I think he has tried to do that over the last 15 years with the nth degree. Uh, and um, so let's let's taste a little nth degree as long as I'm talking about. Yeah. It. So are you saying spaghetti and steak are your favorite? Wow. I, I got a, a side question over here, spaghetti and steak. I'm just using those as tongue-in-cheek examples. Um, you know, let's have a little fish and, uh, you know, a little chicken too. Yeah. Everyone comment what's your favorite. We want to know. I see a lot of Reba Ranchers. My head keeps popping into the screen yeah. and it's awkward. <laughs> so the empty degree um, is a concept that um, uh, we got excited about. Uh, when Carl came on board and sort of the opportunity to uh, be as artistic as the vineyard and the winemaking uh, components would allow you. And, and I think that he experimented with his winemaking team up and down the scale to come up with what they thought was the most expressive wines that they could make. And they've been doing a fantastic job of it for the last 15 years. 16 years. So um, I, I love the, the complexity. I love the intensity of the oak in, in the uh, nth degree. It adds a whole nother layer to the finish. It's, I get this um, really toasty nuttiness just coming back up, staying in my throat and mouth. And uh, again, uh, I'm not a sipper, I'm a gulper. And the gulp of this has huge weight and beautiful richness. I see the nth degree is the best bottle of wine I've ever purchased, ever. Mm. Well, thank you, BWK. And I love that everyone says you have a, we have a style. There's a style of Chardonnay for every mood. I agree with that. Yeah, there we go. I've already been in five moods here. So where's the fifth Chardonnay? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, so. Um, How did the Lenti Clone come about? So the, 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 the question off the side was, how did the Wenty clone come about? There's there's really not a Wenty clone. There, there are multiple Wenty selections out in the marketplace from all of the people, from my grandfather, who after Prohibition really started selecting uh, vines that were a compilation of the gear and the Bonnet importations and the gear vineyard Theodore Gear got his original vines from Charles Wedmore, who brought in um, as the uh, viticultural officer of the of the state viticultural commission, brought in a whole bunch of vines between 1880 and 1885, and distributed them to growers around the Livermore Valley as, as well as the state. And and just to set the stage again, the, the pre-prohibition wine business was literally 68% of the volume was in Alameda, Santa Clara, Sonoma, and Napa counties. There was next to no vineyards in the San Joaquin and Sacramento valleys. The next largest wine growing area was 
Los Angeles County and Riverside County. So prohibition changed the, the nature of the wine business to where we planted varieties for shipping and home wine making. And the production of those varieties uh, was really effective and efficient in the San Joaquin Sacramento Valleys during prohibition. And the loss of all of the fine varieties then um, caused uh, a very small uh, amount of remaining vineyard that we selected through and began to expand after prohibition. So, uh, so where the Wente clone really came from was this idea of constant vine to vine improvement, looking for intensities, looking for um, selection that that would work. Um, the as we just discussed earlier, the the uh, Martin Ray Palmasan Mount Eden clones really originated from the same source. They're different selections, different intensities, but wonderful wines. The thing you had to realize about Chardonnay back in those days was that it was a very low producing variety. At the best, you could get a ton and a half per acre. And so it was not attractive to a lot of wine growers who were saying, well, how am I going to make a profit out of a ton and a half per acre? You could get four tons per acre in Simeon or Columbar or a number of other white varieties. And with uh, Grenache or Carignan or Zinfandel, you could get a lot of tonnage uh, as well. But Cabernet was a very low yielder and Pinot Noir was particularly low yielding. So um, the whole uh, expansion of Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Cabernet was a very slow process because it was targeted at the very fine wine market that could afford to pay for growers that grew very small quantities of intense flavored wines. One of the big revolutions that happened for Chardonnay was in the mid-1950s, Dr. Olmo and Dr. Ali at UC Davis, and along with the staff, I don't want to be leaving anybody out that participated in how to develop or to clean up virus and varieties, but they came up with a system they called the heat treating system where they could take cuttings uh, from a variety and expose it to moderate heat, like 120 degree, degrees for a couple of weeks, and it would kill all the virus or 120, 100 days or something. I forget how long they went, but probably around 100, 120 days. Uh, and it would kill the virus, the latent virus in the vines. When they did that with Chardonnay, with some of the Winty selections, some of the Martin Ray selections, et cetera, it really um, made the varieties yield better so that you could get three, four, five tons per acre rather than one and a half tons per acre. And it allowed the uh, grower and the winemaker the ability to really expand those markets, and, and the same is true with Pinot Noir and Cabernet, that to expand those markets um, at, at an economic basis. So uh, it, it um, you know, it was a struggle all the way through. So with that, we still love it. We didn't lose the flavor of the variety, which was the key thing. Um, the, the intensities and the flavors that my grandfather had worked for uh, still come through. Yeah, and so there was a question. Can anyone buy the Nth Degree or do you have to be a club member? It's available online. You can buy any of it online. And there are some selectly out there in the market, but probably the easiest place to find it would be online. There you go. So um, the, the, we make a number of limited production items that uh, we do sell online. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully at the tasting room coming again really soon because I'm ready to open up. <laughs> <laughs> Safe. <laughs> Safely, of course, but um, we, I, I know we all hope that. So uh, as I've told a number of my restaurant tour friends, I will be the first one at your bar. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> um, let's see, what else can I tell you about um, Chardonnay? So from the um, really small, humble beginnings in the in 1933, 34, 35, Chardonnay grew slowly. By 1960, there were only 230 acres of Chardonnay in the entire state of California, and Winty was growing about 70 acres of it then, so just about 30% uh, in 1960. Um, a really fun thing happened for the Winty family. Uh, in 1960, the Michelin Guide came and did a review 
of the restaurants and wines of the United States and published it uh, in the 1961 Michelin Guide and called the 1959 Wenty Chardonnay, the finest white wine in America, equal to French white burgundies. And uh, it, it uh, was reprinted in Life magazine, uh, the Michelin Guide comments, uh, and it sparked a mini Chardonnay boom. The very next year, 2,500 acres of Chardonnay was planted, so almost a tenfold increase of Chardonnay. And guess where they came to get the Chardonnay? From Grandpa Ernie. <laughs> and that was the first of the Winty selections that really went viral. Um, people uh, like the McCrae's at Stony Hill and the Hansel or the Zeller box at Hansel and other uh, small producers had already uh, made selections from Winty, but uh, really the, uh, the early 1960s Chardonnay uh, really started to grow. And then uh, uh, another big event happened that you guys have all seen, the, the 76 Paris tasting that made uh, Chateau Montalena and others, uh, the top Chardonnays against the, the French, and boom, Chardonnay took off. Uh, and now it's the number one uh, varietal. It's almost 100,000 acres of plantings in California from a mere 200 acres in 1962, uh, 100,000 acres by 2000. So uh, extraordinary. Uh, people are doing great things with it, making great wines, uh, and um, I, I and the styles are uh, what's incredible that uh, we have this opportunity to taste all these different styles of wine. Yeah. Um, so let's see, what am I going to go back to? I'm going to go back to a little morning fog. I'm going to stay here in the Little Moore Valley. There was fog this morning. Did you all see it? The whole valley was covered by gray clouds and. Uh, Ah, I have a request for some Eric Chardonnay over here. Look at that. Thirsty people. That's Nikki who doesn't want to be in the picture. I don't know why. <laughs> oh, there she is. See, they actually, Wine Wednesday with Nikki and Allie. Now they actually showed their faces. Um, <laughs> mm. Okay, any, any Let's see, what other question questions is, do we have? How or why um, does Chardonnay keep its number one status? I think it's, people just have, love it. How does Chardonnay keep its number one status? Yeah, I, I honestly believe that it's what we were talking about, that it, it's so receptive to winemaking expression that and regional expression that it allows, it, it can fill the um, spectrum of five to 10 wines. Uh, and um, I, and other, vari other white varieties don't really do that. I mean, to a certain extent, Pinot Gris does that. If you look at um, uh, Pinot Gris that go from a style like Eric's to barrel fermented, they can have this range of expressions, but it's not as uh, not as accepted right now. Sauvignon Blanc is a very singularly strong flavored variety where people love it or it's not their thing. And uh, uh, we've done experiments over the years, barrel fermenting Sauvignon Blanc, et cetera. So, uh, but Chardonnay uh, really does uh, allow uh, great expression and people uh, embrace those different styles. Awesome. Um, what is the, um, I'm saying like, what is the second variety in acreage to Chardonnay? Probably Cabernet. Cabernet Sauvignon yeah. um, is definitely the um, number two variety planted uh, in California. And number three, I believe now, well, uh, outside of, of uh, we're talking classic varieties, and, uh, but um, there, there's still lots of plantings of um, big volume varieties um, uh, in the Central Valley. But if we're not talking about making wine out of Thompson seedless right now, but um, uh, I believe Pinot Noir has moved up to number three and Merlot is number four. Nikki, this might be a question for you. They want to know what different bricks these wines are picked at. You would know. Uh, you know that? Well, Nikki can join in, but um, <laughs> oh, okay. uh, what, what the question is, what bricks are the, are the grapes picked at? Uh, bricks being roughly a measure of the percentage of sugar uh, in the grape when it's harvested. Uh, so, uh, again, that goes to the style and the winemakers and their signature. Uh, go ahead, Nikki, chime in. 
Um, right. So it could be anywhere from 22 to 28. Yeah. So for we shoot for on Eric's, we shoot for around 21 to 21.5. So it's a kind of a tight window to pick this wine because we want to retain a lot of natural acidity and get more of that lemon zest, uh, green apple feeling here. And then morning fog, we shoot for around 23 bricks, but sometimes it could get up to 24 bricks. Um, and as you increase bricks, I have a really great graph and maybe we'll post this one day, but it kind of shows you like the way that the flavors change. So it's like 20 bricks, you have like a raw lemon and then 21, it's like lemon turning to green apple. And then 22, it's like a Granny Smith green apple. And then 23, you're getting into more of that Fuji apple. And it kind of goes up from there um, to all the way to, to papaya, you know, at, at the end. So. Revo, we, we don't pick before 24 bricks. Um, and then N degree, we usually go 24.5 and up to 26. Um, so just trying to get really rich, really beautiful, higher alcohol, because all that sugar then converts into alcohol um, through fermentation. But yeah. Cool. And we were here this whole time. Yeah. Surprise. <laughs> Wine Wednesday. <laughs> I remember, I think it was, and, and, Maybe Eric would remember if he's watching. I think it was like 1975. We had a, a very rainy harvest, and we had in Arroyo Seco some Chardonnay that that uh, went botrytis uh, infected on us, and uh, we ended up with a uh, some grapes or wine that was like um, 30 bricks, and uh, we ended up selling it to uh, uh, Charlie Wagner at Camus, and they bottled it and made this and made amazing award-winning late harvest Chardonnay. So you can do anything just about like anything with Chardonnay. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, so okay. we haven't, we haven't reinvented the late harvest Chardonnay lately, but uh, we have done a lot of great late harvest recents. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, dad. What else do we have to talk about? Where's the question? Wait, dad, tell, oh, tell us the one, the late harvest Riesling that you picked on January 1st. Uh, yes. we, Nikki wanted to know about the late harvest reason we picked on January 1st. We had one year where um, the, the Riesling um, got some botrytis, but we didn't have a hard frost and uh, the leaves stayed on the vine. We left the grapes hanging on the vine down in a row a long, long, long time when we finally uh, said, you know, this is amazing. So we picked uh, a late harvest Riesling in the next calendar year, which was, uh, you know, once in a lifetime sort of thing. So fun. Um, are all of the different Chardonnays fermented and treated the same once picked? No. So are, are the Chardonnays, I'm assuming everybody can hear Ali question off the side, but are the Chardonnays picked and uh, uh, fermented the same once picked? No. So uh, the fermentation styles uh, vary. The temperature varies. Um, the, whether we ferment them in stainless steel or in barrels or in um, some, you know, some people ferment in cement, some people ferment in large wood tanks, open top wood tanks, etc. So each winery has its own style. And depending on the, you know, the, the type or style of wine that you're trying to create, you're going to um, both pick it at a different time, as Nikki said, and also ferment it in a way in which um, you, you believe it yields the flavors you're looking for. A lot of people use different yeast, different um, outcomes. Think about making a sparkling wine cuvee out of Chardonnay where you're picking it at 18 bricks, keeping the acid really high, and uh, then re-fermenting it in the bottle to make uh, a Blanc de Blanc. What are the grapes on the golf course on hole five with the green netting over them? Very specific question. Cabernet. <laughs> the uh, uh, three three seven. Yeah. So uh, please come out and play Wenty Vineyards Golf Course. We're open again. Yeah. Uh, we would love to see you. Uh, I really truly believe it's the greatest golf course in Northern California. Uh, now, now I'm exaggerating. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> No, no, I, I love it. It's my favorite. Look, I'm wearing the Wenty Vineyards for sure. <laughs> um, so on hole number, between holes four, five, and one, there's a vineyard that has been replanted, and it has green netting over it, and it is a young Cabernet Sauvignon vineyard. Uh, that, and the reason for the green netting is that 
Um, we try to keep most of the deer out of the golf course, but they get in they still and get in. they love young vines and they'll come munch them all if we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I see uh, Janine wants to know which is our least oaky Chardonnay. And I think that is definitely Eric's because it does not have any oak yeah. contact or influence at all. Yeah. Eric Chardonnay, zero oak, 100% stainless steel, no malolactic, beautiful, clean, fresh. Uh, fermentation, uh, great. This is Chardonnay. This is what Sh Eric Chardonnay is what Chardonnay grapes taste like on the vine. There you go. Little influence. Well, I think you did a good job. How are we doing? Yeah, I think we're, we are a final, well, we, final, close We've gone 40 time. minutes. That's the yeah. longest show ever. Come on, <laughs> everybody. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you had fun. Be well. Um, cheers. Enjoy. Uh, smile, give all your close friends a hug, <laughs> your family, whoever's in, habitating with you, and uh, uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.